everyone, and welcome to Another Bite, where we rewatch the most innovative and intriguing pitches from Shark Tank. I'm Jory, and I'm joined by the ambitious, the adaptable, and the admirable Ariel. Hey, friends. Some hobbies, like hiking, can come cheap. Other hobbies, not so much. Rabid collectors will shell out thousands of dollars to get the latest and greatest hat, figurine, or sneaker. Today's founders are banking on just that. Will their sneaker company, inspired by the auspicious date of 1587, be a hit? Or will the sharks see this as more of a miss? We'll find out after this break. Marketing used to be fun. And with HubSpot's newly launched marketing and content hubs, it can be fun again. With tools like Content Remix to turn existing content into all new assets, lead scoring to shine a light on the leads most likely to purchase, and an analytics suite for out-of-the-box reports, it's quick to get you results. It's easy to use, and it connects all your data. So put the fun back in your marketing funnel with HubSpot. Visit HubSpot.com to get started for free. Today in the tank, we have 1587 sneakers, and I promise, loyal listeners, I will definitely say that number wrong at least once during this segment, because 1587, very specific. Anywho, 1587 sneakers is brought to us by founder Sam and Adam, who are asking for $100,000 for 15.87% of their business, which is a whopping $360,000 valuation. Now, 1587 Sneakers is a sneaker company, and it's entirely based on this year that is the first time that an Asian stepped foot on North America, which was 1587. And their product is a sneaker company that's trying to drill into the very rich history that Asian Americans have with our country. So they're trying to prove that Asian Americans aren't just follower consumers, particularly in the realm of sneakers, that they're leaders and they are leading the gang in terms of classic styles and affordable products that are also made from quality materials. So you'll see that this product is actually marketing primarily towards Asians, although we find out later in the pitch that 30% of the customers actually aren't Asians, but they're selling direct to consumers. And I think we can think about this as a, a bit more of like a lifestyle brand that focuses primarily on well-made shoes from Italy. As of the tank, they had started 10 months ago, so it's very much still a new company. But thinking about our pitch, our founders, and our products, Ariel, thoughts on 1587 sneakers? I love the branding. I'm sure we'll dive into it. Yes. So it was giving Kahawa 1893 coffee a little bit. Remember, we actually interviewed the founder in a past episode. And it really reminded me of this coffee brand because it's so rooted in a piece of history that we don't Mm. learn so much about in the American school system. So I love the fact that they were able to tie in something that is preserving history, that is serving as a voice to underrepresented voices within the sneakerheads community. I think these are all really strong differentiators for the brand itself. I think this product, though, when we think about sneakers, highly competitive market, the sharks kind of get into distribution channels. And I think they're mostly in alignment that like retail may not be the best space. Sure. But... I think the way that the story is told and the fact that this roots so much into history an actual is history. a differentiator mm-hmm. compared to a Nike or a Foot Locker. It's less about the designs of the shoes. It's less about the feels and the experience. To me, their main bread and butter for this product is the brand and how effectively they can tell the story. Yes. Visually, beautiful branding, very clean, minimalistic. But I think they need to ensure that where they are showing up from a distribution perspective communicates that story effectively or else there is nothing that is going to drive folks to purchase these shoes from a brand that they haven't heard of before or don't understand the context behind 1587 versus other bigger brands in the space. And it gets a little sticky, right? Because the concept, gorgeous. Lifestyle brand following on Instagram, Less so. So we find out, like, as of the taping, that they have 7,000 followers, which, again, is still a following. Mm -hmm. It is a following. They exist. But it's very difficult when you need that flashpoint of virality and growth. I guess it comes back to sort of like the fundamentals of we have a good story. We have a good concept. How do we build a community? 
So when talking about like a lifestyle brand or building a community, especially around like a physical consumer good, what would you recommend these founders look into to experience that sort of scale and to get that story out? Because I think it's an awareness problem, Mm -hmm. less of a like product or quality problem. Yeah. I mean, for being 10 months in the business, definitely an awareness play. I think between Sam and Adam, they mentioned that I think one of them was an influencer, right? That has like a pretty steady following. Mm -hmm. I think that is the play here. You can tap into influencers within the Asian American community. First thing that came to mind, my unhinged thought is the ABGs, the Asian baby girls who are very aesthetically cute, Mm -hmm. fashionable, Mm -hmm. like showing off their outfits. Like I think there's really fun influencers within that space that could already have that domain authority and audience to increase awareness and exposure, but it cannot be their only means because if they continue to be this niche, they are going to run into a lot of challenges. I think they best need to position this brand as this is how we're reinventing the shoe category. Yeah. It hasn't changed in the last 50 years. The way that Nike, Foot Locker, all these brands go to market hasn't changed. This needs to be disruptive. This is 1587. Be a part of that disruptive kind of moment and rethink the way that underrepresented voices have a seat at the table in this Mm -hmm. industry. I think that's the broader push that they need to keep fundamentally. Tactically, though, they could reach out to very specific Asian communities, but I really think they need to be more broad in their audience. Yeah. The thing too is they need to engage the sneakerhead community. Now, I will (laughs) be very transparent that... I don't know anything about sneakerheads, Ariel. I'm front-loading that yeah. in terms of my recommendation here. But we've seen similar products on Shark Tank. So I'm going to take a similar flavor of recommendation as our uh, custom hats product that we reviewed a couple months ago. And I think what they should do is they should focus on sort of the rabid purchasing power of like a super obsessed fan base, right? So it's like sneakerheads, I'm assuming, based on just that name alone, really are focused on getting the newest, coolest sneaker. Cool. Amazing. You can tap into the psychology of that buying behavior any day of the week. You want to do it to a specific demographic? Love that even more. Get the artists that are known in the Asian American community, get them painting or customizing certain sneakers, doing super limited drops. Get your favorite influencers designing with you, even if it's like specific colors. They don't even have to be complicated sneakers, like two block colored sneakers that are designed by your favorite influencer. Do a limited drop. Like get it so that people have incentive to keep coming back to your social media platform because it's not just about followers. It's also getting people to continuously re-engage with you Mm -hmm. and repurchase from you, right? Because you just don't want someone to own one pair of sneakers and then, you know, they fall off and you never get them again. This type of like community building and sort of lifestyle brands, like you need people bought in. And the best way I could think about doing it if you have this type of product is like, you need to do limited drops, you need to gamify it in some way, and then just get the people that are already big names in your community doing it. That's artists, that's musicians, that's your favorite influencers. You could do like really fun things with influencers that maybe are in the gaming community, but they still design something super specific for you. Like I think you could tap into multiple communities that are within your larger demographic and then just have them each build custom sneakers with you. And through a couple of just strategic partnerships or influencer marketing campaigns with the right people, you just get more eyes on you. And sure, it's going to cost some money up front, but I think it's also going to show that you're really valuing that community. But I think it's going to take more than just them telling their story on social to get there. Yeah. But I am curious about how you would expand this, how you would continue to scale their go-to-market where it is more of a like sneakers for everyone while still kind of maintaining that really strong brand story around the Asian American community. So I think from what I know about sneakerheads, never ever wear the shoes. Oh. And the more rare and exclusive the shoe is or harder to find, drops them. the better. So I think you're onto something with the limited time offering. Cool. So if I was going to broaden this, I would start first with a base of Asian American influencers. Yeah. Offer some kind of incentive for the influencers that you're working with to design a shoe. Mm. If it's going to be a limited time offering and you have your production all in place and manufacturing's in a good spot, why not just offer that? And I think to your point, you know, that continuous engagement algorithms love that. The more that you share and send videos, the higher you bump up in your organic algorithm. So I think by training your buyers to know, okay, a drop is happening the first Friday of every month. 
this upcoming month. It's going to be the specific influencer that I love. You get some cross promotion going on. I think that's a really strong way to kind of build that awareness and build that audience first. And then, you know, from there expanding on, you know, I think continuing to have you know, a pipeline of artists or influencers within the community is critical to make this be successful. So I think really having a clear thought out partner program or influencer program in place will definitely be a game changer story can only carry so far. Yeah. And, you know, I was thinking about it too, is it doesn't even go that much against their current manufacturing play. Granted, they're still proving out concept and things. So they're only getting these sneakers in small batches. But if you're doing limited drops, small batch production is actually not a bad thing, right? Because you would want them to be really exclusive. So while they mentioned that they're like moving away from like Italian manufacturers, I don't think they would need to, as Damon mentioned, like produce a bunch of these sneakers in a bunch of sizes, right? Like you have what you have. And once it's gone, You don't have to worry about carrying all that inventory overhead. Mm -hmm. So then we start to dive into the costs. I'm just going to talk about it in terms of their Italian productions because there's a lot that's happening now that they're moving their manufacturers to Asia, but this is what we know so far. So as of the taping, cost to make in Italy around $110. That's expensive to make. They do mention that it's quality Italian leather and whatnot, and they're able to get- there's no reason. I'm sorry. (laughs) When I heard that, I was so shocked. I was like, there is some low-hanging fruit that you can kind of cut. They are getting it down to 50 with their new manufacturer in Asia. They do say that. Okay. But it's the cost to the consumer. And like, again, maybe this is because I'm not a sneakerhead, but like they mentioned that Originally, they were selling these for $288. They did get it down to $175, but these are very much a premium sneaker. Granted, they're projected to make $500,000 as of this year because this is the taping year, but expensive sneakers. Is that premium? I feel like sneakers can go way, depending on the shoe. Maybe. Right? Because these are everyday Again, shoes. not a sneakerhead. <laughs> these aren't collection shoes. You're paying $288 to walk around in your sneakers day to day. I am not this persona. I pay $200 for good hiking boots. Sure. It's not necessarily that big of a jump. Remember Tom's when Tom's were a thing? I was never and a like Tom's everyone was buying Tom's because of the social component of it. Sometimes people will pay more Fair. for a product That's if true. it aligns to them. that they believe in. Yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> But Tom's was because they were giving back to the community. Right now, there's not that flywheel with this company. Right. And so was Kahawa 1893 too. Now, when I think about maybe that's what they need is a social company. Even I bought Kahawa 1893 because of the giving back to the community, right? Like, (laughs) yeah, yeah. there's not that component here. But I do get it in terms of like believing in the founders. The power of belief is really what you're saying is like going to drive purchases. And I totally agree. But yeah, average purchase, $170. Compared to a CAC, again, we don't get the channels here. I have a sense that it's somehow related to social media, but $45 to acquire a customer, which I don't know, it seems kind of high. I need your take on that though. Like on something like Instagram and Facebook, $45 is that high? Yes. I would say for Instagram and Facebook, that is a much higher CAC. Now, if they were running programmatic ads, so like ads that show up in TV or on streaming services or like those pre-ads that you skip on like YouTube videos, I don't think that would necessarily be a much higher customer acquisition cost. I think it's just the early stages too of this Mm -hmm. business, right? They're 10 months running as a business. It takes a few months. Yeah. And it takes a few months. You're going to be testing and experimenting. And anytime you're introducing a new product in market, you're going to have a higher cost per acquisition because you're going to learn what are the right targeting filters to put in Mm -hmm. place? Who is your audience over time? And as you get smarter, that CAC should go down. For sure. So I don't think it's necessarily they're in the worst spot for where they're at. I don't think it's an indicator that there's a lack of interest. I just think they need more of that awareness and market in order to get more sales and more conversion. And then they'll see things kind of net out a little bit more. Yeah. And I think ultimately it's sort of because they were so new to the market that we saw the sharks responding like they did, because I think their numbers are very indicative of a company that is in the beginning stages of being successful. Granted, they are making sales, but I think because of the competitive space and the perceived lack of traction, time will tell if that's actually true. 
all of our sharks either went out because this is just like not their business portfolio or because again, as a competitive market, they need to like explode super quickly. And while Mark did say that they should focus on D to C, which I think they primarily are, instead of focusing into retail, which they did talk about pivoting into. No, that would be suicide. Suicide! Uh, All of the sharks did go out. Womp womp. But I do have a good update for you, like a small good update, even though this just happened. Yes. They have 9,000 Instagram followers post Shark Tank. So they have had at least some Shark Tank bump. Maybe in a couple of years, we'll hear about like the actual numbers about how many they sold post Shark Tank. But it does seem like Shark Tank has helped them at least build more brand awareness. So Mm -hmm. I'm excited to see what comes from this company. Also, just like as a jewelry note, they were both Boston boys and Boston will always have a place in my heart. I don't know about the Boston sneakerhead scene, but I just love it when fun things come out of Massachusetts. And their names are Sam and Adam. Yeah, I know. It's like so many good things. Like (laughs) we're rooting for you, Sam and Adam, just because it's just like I'm a Massachusetts girly. Anywho. You can definitely check out 1587 Sneakers online because, yeah, still in business. Production for today's episode was brought to you by Ari Desarmo. Editing comes from Robert Hartwig and support from Alfred Schultz. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify Podcasts, or wherever you subscribe to the greatest podcasts ever. That does it for me. See you next week in the tank for another bite. I want to tell you about a podcast I think you might like if you want to succeed in sales. It's called Sales Evangelist, and it's hosted by Donald Kelly. Each week, you'll learn about the successful strategies used by the world's best sales experts and successful sellers. You'll hear from folks like Jeffrey Gittimer, Jill Conrath, Bob Berg, and Guy Kawasaki. You'll get actionable insights and stories that will encourage, challenge, and motivate you. If you want to take off in your sales career and earn the income you want, Find Sales Evangelist wherever you get your podcasts.